Okay, so as you can see, I already started this drawing in pencil. So here's the story. A friend of mine um, who was my photographer at my wedding called me up and he's been he's been seeing me create uh, drawings for quite a while. And uh, he called me up and told me that he would like to commission me to do a drawing. I was uh, waiting in line to get my, or waiting on my hair appointment, my hair appointment, get my hair cut. And I, uh, we had to kind of work out a size that would work for him. Um, he's been collecting some art recently and wanted to add to his collection, but this time with an Adam Wellborn original. And uh, I was quite flattered. Of course, at the time he called me, though, I had another big project in the in the works. I was doing a, a mural for a new restaurant that was opening up in Brookhaven, which is the north end of Atlanta. And uh, that one I got to actually be fairly creative with, so that was cool. Um, I did, uh, I want to say it was like a 10 foot by 25 foot wall mural inside. And then a, uh, in addition, like a decorative stripe situation. I've actually not quite finished it. Do it on the outside. And that was a 40 foot, maybe a 50 foot long wall. So <clears throat> I was kind of busy with that, but, uh, my friend understood and so that was fine. And I would, you know, get his piece the first of the year. So what I realized was that what he wanted was the, one of the drawings done in this style that I do where the detail is, it's kind of insane. And, uh, I usually do these detailed drawings in kind of a meditative state. So uh, I'd only done one commission in this style um, since I embarked on this, this particular visual journey of creating these super detailed renderings. So knowing that I had till the first of the year, by the way, it's... Uh, January 6th now, 2022. And we had this conversation back in November. Um, but kind of knowing how long it took me to do that last drawing, which was months, I realized I should start the preliminary work ahead of time and get something. That, there's my damn head in the screen. I am going to uh, figure out a better camera angle. So Hopefully, in the next couple of videos I'll release like this, uh, my head will be popping in. But after that, hopefully it won't. <laughs> hopefully I can fix that. So anyway, you see me creating these shapes here with this detail that I envisioned as the octopus skin texture. So obviously I'm throwing an octopus tentacle. So you get back to my friend. He asked me to do this commission and I said, well, what do you want? And he said, I, I just want something in your style. The style that reminds me of H.R. Geiger. And I was, like I said, I was flattered. Um, and I said, well, is there any particular thing you want? And he said, um, I mean, I really like sharks and octopus. Those are my favorite animals. And I was like, okay, cool. Um, uh, you know, anything else? Nope. Nope. I think I'm just going to say that and let it go. And I was like, that I really appreciate because that just leaves it wide open for me to create. So I have never drawn an octopus and before what you're seeing here. And um, I used to draw sharks when I was like in third grade and shit. Oh, look. So anyway, I finished that tentacle and now I've played around and created 
this drawing, which I'm playing around creating. So the octopus tentacle is a study uh, to kind of understand, you know, the, the shape and the body of the octopus. And I did these as further studies a lot more loosely and just a free flowing kind of fashion. And I also started looking at some underwater scenes. And one of the things that, that kind of jumped out at me when I was doing a Google image search was uh, underneath piers. So the piers on the beach that you see going out, held up by those giant wooden stilts. Those things are usually just completely engulfed in crustaceans and coral or some kind of just sea animal texture. And it's, it's so rich and so dense and so beautiful uh, from the images that I looked at that I, I started thinking, wow, you know, I've been on the, the beach and seeing people catching fish uh, right off the pier and I've seen videos of sharks right around the pier and um, some squid, some different animals. And so I thought, well, obviously a shark and an octopus could exist underneath a pier uh, at the same time, if they didn't know each other was there, obviously. Um, and so I began to just kind of weave together uh, the shark and the octopus uh, shapes under the pier kind of a situation. And in doing this, you know, this shark type mouth that's open up above. Um, I want to say just kind of float into this mirror image of itself. And as it did that, the octopus is kind of manifested in a mirror image too. And then, so I got this equal balanced composition and started to create. And I didn't intend for any of this. Uh, I was just kind of in a flow with it all. And, well, if you haven't seen it by now, it obviously got sexual. Um, and I've gone back in and revised. But then uh, what I started to see was that, like, there was an opportunity to bring in netting. So there's an element of netting that's now going to appear uh, in this image. So I've, I'm, yeah, I guess I'm a little bit embarrassed. <clears throat> By the sexual element. Once you really see it, um, it's kind of hard to unsee, I suppose. But I wanted to create eh, enough interest within the image that it wasn't the thing that people would get hung up on, something that you could see beyond and see the rest of the depth and the texture. And I'm also trying to create a space, I suppose, like I said, none of this was really intentional, but what I'm doing is creating a space below the pier that is almost like outer space and how bizarre it is and how scary it might seem uh, to someone that doesn't know what they're looking at. Now, my friend that commissioned me to do this, he, uh, for recreation, shark fishes. He, he fishes for sharks and um, he's a catch and release guy, you know. Uh, gentle with the, with the creature. He, he actually loves them. So it's not like he's out there trying to, you know, 
hit a shark in the head with a shovel once he pulls it ashore. It's not about that at all. It's for the recreation of it, from what he from what he tells me and from what I've seen in his Instagram posts and things. So, um, and I don't think that he's the actually I know, I know I'm well enough to know that he's not the type of guy to overly sexualize uh, women or men um, for that matter uh, to the point of asking me for something like this. He did not. However, he's not closed minded in a sense that he would uh, reject this piece. And I know that as well. So what I'm just focusing on, let's get back to the drawing. You can see here that I'm starting to do this netting and I'm trying to do it to the contour of the shape. And in doing so, I've, I've already done it once, but I'm going to erase and you know, now go back. Uh, trying some different spirals that I created in vellum on for size. You just saw that. But now what I'm doing is, uh, well, just trying to conform more shape uh, and lighting. And some lighting in there to make the shapes kind of round out where they need to and pop forward where they need to with more contrast. Uh, brought the pen in, I will go back to pencil. So this is just a sketch for the drawing anyway. So I'm not, I'm not hung up on this. The uh, actual drawing is gonna be 18 by 24 inches. I think this sketchbook might be 11 by 14, something like that. So it's significantly smaller than what the actual drawing is gonna be. Um, just working out really the composition, some shapes. I do go into some detail because, like I said before this video, I've never drawn an octopus and I haven't drawn a shark since I was in third grade, maybe. So uh, there's there's quite a bit for me to work out here as far as understanding, having a respect for um, the things that I don't know uh, visually and uh, try to create some shapes here. So, uh, yeah. Obviously an octopus doesn't look uh, just like this. This is from my imagination. Once I did the studies where I actually look at source material, uh, for these types of drawings, I will look at the source material on my draw. A few of the things that are in the source material. But then after that, I just freehand sketch these without looking at anything. You know, put on some audio that I enjoy, maybe some good music, and um, just kind of go to it. So a uh, little bit working on the, the, the pillar that holds the pier up there, or the post that holds the, the pier up, with a little bit of texture to create a dark shadow. And now onto the octopus tentacle to do the same. And this didn't really capture the, the tentacle's depth of form. So eventually I worked that out again. But, and all of that is hindsight. This is nothing that I can see while I'm doing this, by the way. These are things that, that I figure out later. So, when you see a final drawing from a lot of artists as a, as a final work uh, or a final painting or, or print, uh, a lot of artists will produce several drawings leading up to that. Um, in some cases, the sketches might have more time in them than the actual finished drawing because something occurs during the sketching process where, and I'll just speak for myself, I learn the subject material in a new way that I couldn't have learned just by trying to produce a final product right off the rip. Uh, so especially in dealing with something that I have not drawn before, even if I've drawn something before, like I've drawn tons and tons of people, but, I remember when I was commissioned to do uh, some some portraits 
there's some different portraits over the years that I've taken a lot of photos of the people and sketched them out first and get an understanding for the shapes that comprise their face. And then uh, different lighting elements, of course, will uh, make the, the face look completely different in some images. And that, I think that's why there's such a weird aspect to like <clears throat> social media, like Instagram or Facebook back in the days when people would post these these completely different type of lighting situations and angles that <laughs> they just didn't really typically look like, you know, they wouldn't look like that in real life. And I think this happens to my friends on dating apps now and they feel like they get, uh, they call it catfished when they get to a date and the individual does not look anything like their profile picture because they're using some, some image that, that just captured them in a whole new light. And sometimes when I'm getting source material for a portrait, I'll get the same thing. And people sometimes will ask me, I just do that one. And um, I've just dismissed those clients uh, during the interview because uh, for one, it just leaves me one image to work from. And, you know, in some cases they've been memorial pieces where the person has passed on and one image to work with is just simply not enough for a portrait. And so somebody's kind of dictating that they want just this one particular image of a person. It's just visually insufficient. So I'll turn something like that down immediately. But even then the ones that I take on, I'll often see one of those in the bunch, in the handful where it just doesn't look the same. Doesn't look like the same person. So, uh, not that I'll exclude that completely from what I'm doing, but I want to make these studies from several different lighting sources, several different perspectives. Uh, usually, if it's a person who always wore glasses, I want images with the glasses off. I, I would prefer that because I want to understand the the bone structure, the muscle structure, the, the skin texture around the eyes, uh, the way the eyebrows form around the eyes. Um, a lot of that can be obscured by something as simple as a pair of glasses, but so things happen and reveal to me, you know, the actual shapes when I study these things. So do, 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 do. look at, look at this. Just building out these shapes like crazy. So did I overwork the the sketch? Maybe. Um, <laughs> you, you know what? You'll be the judge of that before it's all said and done. Um, I think there was just some details. And, and this is different, though, than what I'm talking about with uh, the portraiture and and looking at a lot of source material and trying to recreate some of the source material and draw from the images. I did look at a lot of stuff before I started drawing this. So let's, let's take that into consideration too. I kind of immersed myself for a, not one day, but stretch out over a course of days I immersed myself in the, the source material for about eight hours where I would just browse through thousands of images. Um, and I saw so many shapes and so many different forms and creatures that I, I'd never really paid attention to. Aquatic life, aquatic, um, not landscape, but, you know, large, just coral reef and um, these these shots, these piers from underneath, these different things. So, so similarly to doing a portrait, you know, I study the images. I did draw some, uh, I did a couple of composures of piers from underneath um, before I ever approached this. And really, this is a very simplified version of a pier from underneath because all we're really seeing of the pier 
is two posts and the top of the water. Okay, you can see I've really gone to town at this point. So we skipped on. I'm filming this in chunks, but I'm not filming every piece of this, by the way. So you can see from seconds ago, we've jumped into a massive amount of detail in the shark's mouth now. And on those posts, those pier posts. So what we're seeing really from the pier situation or the pier landscape, so to speak, is just these two posts in the top of the water. But what it created was a whole lighting situation that underwater works a different way than it would above water. Also, it, it, there's a lot more shadow play than would be if it wasn't, you know, interacting with a pier underneath. So, so I've got a lot of stuff that I got to work out, a lot of complexity here with not just the shapes and textures of the sea creatures that I'm creating and all the texture and lighting and shading that goes into uh, the rounded parts of the elements to get them to, to kind of recede back into space. But I'm also dealing with, well, I've got a definitive uh, or not so definitive lighting source from above. I've got a fractal broken lighting source from above from the top of the water. So I studied a lot of that too, to understand what the environment would be below as far as how it was lit. So that's something that I haven't really worked out in this sketch yet. So this is not, like I said, this is not the final drawing. And there's another sketch that's going to be coming up uh, where I try to work more on the environmental lighting of the of the the scene where i really account for the light coming in through the broken top of the water and it being like more like shards of light and they only reach so far because of the density of the material that's in the water may it be sand or or seaweed or, or, you know, just little micro creatures that fill the water, that filter the light out as it goes only so far down. So what happens underneath the pier, there's a lot of breaking water because the water's breaking along the legs of these posts. And so it's not a clear depth like you might have out in the middle of a calm sea on a scuba expedition. So I had to account for that. So now <clears throat> getting back to what's going on currently on the screen, uh, it looks like I've now flipped the page, which I'm not going to have this luxury later when this drawing's 18 by 24, by the way, to flip the page around. What I'm doing is, just freehanding, and this is getting back to that form of the, of the netting along what we'll call these legs. And the form of that netting following the musculature of the legs. Uh, this very much reminds me of like a, the story of the Black Dahlia um, because of this disembodied, sexualized female here. Um, which reminds me of the song Plush by Stone Temple Pilots. No, is it Plush? Uh, I think that's the one where he tells the story of Black Dahlia. Anyway, Scott Weiland's dead and gone now too. All the rock and roll heroes are dead, folks. Uh, except for Maynard from Tool. He's still alive. And I think Zach De La Rocha from Rage Against the Machine is still alive, too. Um, Chris Cornell's dead. I got Chester from Lincoln Park's dead. I, yeah, a lot of the good rock stars are dead and gone. Eddie Vedder was dead to me the day that he arrived on the music scene. So anyway, um, 
getting back to what's going on on the screen of switch pins. Did you notice the switch pins? This is actually a product by Sharpie. Uh, if I'm doing a lot of dark and need to fill in faster and reliably with a ballpoint, this is my chosen tool right now. Uh, before I had kind of more of a felt tip that, that Boston baked bean colored brown pen that I was holding in the, the last snippet. Uh, that That's a more of a felt tip situation for calligraphy. And so it's great. This one, uh, it's great for when I'm doing, kind of capturing the borders of shapes, line work, that sort of thing. Uh, and trying to put a real shape to the line you know, the way a calligrapher's pen would, and what it's intended to do. Um, so what I created with that Sharpie was this, these dark areas that you can see here now that have shown up because we've moved clips again. Those black areas that are completely filled in. So I used that ballpoint Sharpie uh, for that. It looked like, and now, so the netting. Here's the trick. I'm giving you a real treat right here. So this netting, if you'll notice, I'm not drawing on top of the lines that I created for the netting and pencil. I'm drawing on both sides of that pencil line. And I'll go back in and erase that pencil line out. So those pencil lines are just guides for me to draw around to create the net because the net has, you know, it, it, it's got its own shadow. It's got its own light, but because it's small and I'm just trying to capture the form of the pencil and the shape of the pencil and the, the composition of how the net wraps over the musculature or the, you know, the shapely areas of the leg and butt here, um, would have come back to is using you know, this really small pen now and going on either side of the pencil line so they can just erase that pencil line out and get it out of the equation. So that's kind of a formula that I developed on the fly here. Um, that was that was pretty cool that that came to me to do that. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to keep working on this net for quite a while. Um, hopefully I don't uh, film all of that. that. That might bore us to death. And I've constructed these videos from the clips that I've taken and then sped each clip up to a thousand percent speed. So, you know, I don't, I don't want to bore anybody to death, but also if anybody's curious in this process, I wanted them to be able to see what actually goes into it. Uh, yeah. So here's an opportunity for some juxtaposition of light and shadow to create depth. Uh, so uh, what you see on the left, for instance, with that pole, vertical pole, and the tentacle coming around it, so right now that tentacle is basically all white and the pole is 80% blackened by the texture of the coral and sea creature growth that's all over it. And now on the right, we had the same situation, but I'm filling in this netting. Uh, and what it's going to create is about a, well, in certain areas of it, it's going to be about a 50% fill on a grayscale if you're to blur your eyes. And that it's gonna put it kind of in a mid-ground. So things in black recede back. Uh, the whites are gonna pu push forward. And what I'm creating now with a mid-tone is a mid-ground. So I've really got there's a, there's a lot of areas because there's a long, you know, grayscale here, but there's really three depths uh, to the image. And what we're going to get is our black, our gray, and our white out of it. 
And the majority of this leg, the netting is going to be a gray tone because I don't want the whole thing to recede, but as the leg comes up and rolls over, there's a darkness from the light source above, but there's also reflection from in the light that works out its own weaker light source down towards not necessarily the bottom, but below these objects that are in the water here. So I've got kind of an ambient light, a light of the environment of the water down below, which is lighting up the lower part of that shape that we're going to call the leg there and in the knitting texture that's over it. And then we've got a more stark directional light coming from the broken water above, right? From the, from the sky above the sun. So I've got to kind of, when I'm working with these shapes, keep those two different lighting sources in mind, the weaker ambient lighting source that is level with the objects and below the objects and the directional lighting source from above. So as things roll over in a shape, uh, so like a sphere or a cylinder, in the case of like these octopus arms, which is just really easy to see on this right octopus, if you look at the arm that's coming out wide in front of the pole, you see a cylinder shape and the cylinder Shape is more or less dividing the two light sources by having a really dark, almost black in the center, in the middle of the cylinder. And then it goes gray below and white on top. Um, that's, that's kind of a, an old basic tip for duality of light sources that I learned a long time ago when I was a kid, just looking at comic books. Um, and some of my, my favorite comic book artists uh, back then were um, Stephen Platt, who I found out about um, through a comic called Prophet, and then later found some of his earlier work where he did uh, a Moon Knight. He kind of guest starred on a, on a Moon Knight comic, just one, uh, from what I know. And I have that one. Uh, I have no idea where it is, but I have that one. It was one of my favorite books to look at before he got big. Um, the work is just, I don't know, it's really good. Um, but yeah, supposedly he did a Spider-Man cover too. And that reminds me of another uh, favorite artist, Todd McFarlane. I know he did a Spider-Man cover. Um, of course, he was really big with Spawn, <clears throat> which has turned into some pretty horrible movies uh, throughout the years, but the book itself was interesting. I liked it as a kid. Um, the artwork was really what I was there for. Um, that was some, some really good stuff. But anyway, um, I figured out really through McFarlane and Platt, these cylinders. So they were just, wizards at pulling off a style that, that you know doesn't really happen in real life it's not it's not necessarily you know just if you break it down to one element it's not believable at all as a real life object but when you put enough of those objects together it manifests as something that is believable enough to the eye and the imagination that it can carry the story through so these guys works were i won't say expressive necessarily as they, you know, mimic the human form in the form of, of course, guns and skulls and uh, chains and, uh, you know, all sorts of battle things and things that produce drama and uh, war. But those objects would all come together in this cohesive whole, uh, even though it just wasn't realistic it was realistic because they finally just stitched everything together with enough form enough shapes to create form and paid attention to the way light actually works so even though the way that they laid down the lines wasn't realistic the fact that they knew the shapes is what pulled it together and the forms and the way light 
uh, reveals forms in different situations because they knew those things because they paid attention to those and their their drawings i imagine and their preliminary work and you know whatever art classes they took or maybe went to art school i never really checked in on their education um, that would have been smart before i went on with my life but but yeah these guys really studied the stuff you, you know they did because you can't just mimic another artist or set of artists and create believable lighting and form without actually studying life drawing. Like that's, that's just not possible. So there had to be some kind of formalized education there, I believe for those two guys anyway. Um, oh, and Jim Lee, good God, the unbelievable works of Jim Lee. Oh. That dude. Who, um, by the way, I know for a fact he's on Instagram. Uh, I follow him there. And <laughs> when I found him on Instagram, I followed him. And to my shock, he followed me back. And I don't know if he actually looked at my my drawings or anything when he followed me back. That would that would be hugely flattering if he looked at my artwork and said, oh, this guy's got some some ideas, some, some original stuff. I should, I should follow another creatively inspired artist. <laughs> My imagination getting away with me here, but yeah, um, he's, uh, incredible and he's still working. Uh, I saw he did some installation pieces recently uh, in a commercial setting. And there was drawings like from his comic books. Like, you know, he, he does a lot of Batman uh, with DC and oh my God, those, those drawings. Uh, I can't, I, I'm just going to sit here and just go, uh, I'm just going to moan about this for the next 10 minutes. No, I'm going to shut up now. But anyway, it, to him and <clears throat> there were a couple others from back then that I don't recall. Um, that I did look at. Image had a really sweet uh, band of artists working for them back in the 90s when I was coming up looking at comics. Um, so, and I think Jim Lee was working for Image back then. I don't know if Todd McFarlane was. And then I think Stephen Platt's Prophet was under Image. It may have been Dark Horse or Marvel. I don't really recall. But anyway. So those guys were, you know, uh, Todd McFarlane was so popular, I saw his face. The other guys I, I had no idea what they looked like. Todd McFarlane showed up in, like, magazines, um, trade magazines, more or less. Okay, this is a lot of focus. If this doesn't come back into focus, we're going to cut it. We got to cut it. Yeah, we're going to cut that. All right, so... Yeah, I've rambled for quite long enough now. I think I've rambled for long enough uh, about these artists who inspired me as a kid. Uh, hopefully in the next video, I'll talk more about artists that have inspired me uh, during my formal education years and uh, later as I began my career and in my career as a working artist. Anyway, uh, I've said a lot probably uh, more than you um, wanted to hear me say. And uh, I appreciate you watching the video. Um, yeah, we'll talk. We'll talk more soon. Stay tuned.